first time I heard you was on a podcast where Larry talked about you, Larry Goldings, and he spoke very highly of you. And uh, he did it in such a way that I had to check you out immediately. He's and great. I paid him a lot of money to do yes. this. We have an ongoing contract. Yeah. Yeah. He's, uh, yeah, you can buy him for, for everything. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so I checked you out, and I think the first song was I heard was uh, this one. Uh, El Jardinero. Yeah. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful song, and that got me interested more. So I checked out all of your videos, and, and um, yeah, I really love your music. Told a lot of my friends about you, and uh, yeah, I have a lot of questions. I'm very interested. I think in your in your compositional process and I, I really want to know how how you do it yeah me too <laughs> where where you start actually that's a that's a question i have yeah okay so for that we have to go into a little bit of a of a journey starting from the fact that the way i understand the guitar in this case uh, which is the instrument i used to compose is um, without uh, any technical or theoretical names. So I don't know the names of the notes I'm playing or the key I'm in or the name of the chords. So the compositional process is completely uh, ear-based and then uh, sensory uh, finger movements and finger patterns. And that's why it's a very complex and interesting process because sometimes a chord is going to come out physically before I hear it just because the fingers find it comfortable to go this way and you'll find this, oh, suddenly right. this chord, this, wow, this sound. So basically it's this, it's sound and I treat the guitar as another voice. So yeah, m much of the music that I write is going to be based on a uh, lineal composition between the guitar and the voice harmonizing each other. Yes? So when so. you compose, do you, do you play the guitar and sing at the same time? Yes, most of the times it will be like that. Many times um, it will start with a melody and the guitar will find its way by harmonizing certain notes of the melody and then filling it up. It's a very visual process. So I will see, I will visualize this, these dots and then the guitar can do in between, you know, it can like make hoops inside and outside and up and down. And that's how the, the song becomes a song. It's very, very visual. Huh. Do you sometimes visualize it really on a like with a pen and paper? And exactly. Solve? Yes, I will. I will draw the line that the melody is doing, or I will imagine two dancers, right? Right. And yeah. how what kind of movement they would make? Yeah, I think it's a very organic way of seeing it, and people really react to to these kind of things because they're completely linked to a representation physically in nature. Right. You know? So you'll be excited about it. Can you show some of those? Uh, those uh, sketches a little bit. Do you have some uh, I don't of them have close any by? here, but I can I can demonstrate yeah. right now. Okay. Yes. Let's see. So many of these concepts are going to be. They have a name in in music theory in Western music notation. You'll be able to you know you you would tell me oh this is this this is that. My way of knowing is by drawing it and being like okay so this is what I'm going to do no. For example, let's say. I'll have this. This mm -hmm. is one line, okay, yeah. which would be like, di -da -da -di -do -di -da -do. okay, mm -hmm. okay, yeah. And then I will draw the guitar, and the guitar. <laughs> wow, it's fascinating! Wow. <laughs> the guitar would be, in this case, the same notes, but different. So it will be. And physically, I don't know if the guitar will be heard well here, but um, like this, right? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, like that. I'll just draw it and then I'll play it. Okay. Does it also sometimes happen without the drawing? 
Yes, for sure. Yes, sometimes it's just sound. Right, Mm -hmm. right. But I mean, some of the stuff, I mean, a lot of the stuff that you're playing on the guitar sounds very intricate and I mean, is very intricate and and sounds also linked to a a deep tradition. Uh, I I suppose a flamenco tradition in Spanish guitar music. Um, Some of these harmony things They sound so uh, like rooted in a in a harmonic understanding to me. Uh, that I'm wondering where it comes from. Yeah, it's not really the case. It's it's funny uh, and sad that in Spain there's not much flamenco culture unless you are from a gypsy family or you're deliberately looking for it. Uh, I I'm from Catalonia, which is the northeast, that actually produced some of the best flamenco performers in the past years. Mm-hmm. Still. I never listened to flamenco when I was a kid or a teenager or a young adult. And there was never flamenco in my house, even though half of my family is from the south, from Andalusia, where flamenco comes from. So funny enough, this was an exposure to my roots from New York, moving to New York and missing home, missing just the concept of who am I, right? Because here there's so many artists and the word immigrant is so strong. In, right. this, in the States, what it means, you want to try and find your way back. So that's when I started listening to flamenco. But my influence... Who did in, you check out? Sorry. Who did you check out? Who did you listen to then? So I listened to Vicente Amigo mm-hmm. first, the guitarist. He's really great. And also he, he kind of like mm, introduces new concepts in flamenco like he's very into jazz and world music it's not traditional traditional flamenco but uh, eventually i stumbled upon manolo sanlucar who is my favorite he has a lot of duets with paco de lucia mm-hmm. and i would say a lot of people will kill me that he's even better to me than <laughs> than paco because he's so so wonderful so clean and so traditional and, and so great yeah mm-hmm. i'm going to check him out I know yeah. I know some of Paco's music, obviously with Camarón. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, that's very, very uh, special music for me, and I really love that. I would like to know more about this music. Uh, yeah. Like, so I'm I'm going to check this guy out. Nice. Yeah, he's he's really great, and so, flamenco is so wonderful because not that long ago was the first time they wrote a book about the theory of flamenco. Flamenco was a totally street learned music you know there were no no written rules about it you had to just be there and experience it so mm-hmm. you'll see videos if you check out the montoya family or the molina family they're like really deeply rooted gypsy families that have the tradition of just having their babies uh in all these performances that they have in their house every day you know for breakfast and lunch and you see these little kids that are not even one years old yeah. doing all the claps and all the the rhythms and they just know it you know? Yeah. it's wonderful a friend showed me something um flamenco music of a, of a particular village in spain where they're clapping swings have you heard this no so it's not even but it's swing. you know it's, it really sounds like swing <laughs> that's crazy yeah. but is it is it uh, old or it's in the newer it sounds vibe? i mean i'm not sure from when i keep forgetting the name uh but uh you know it sounds like maybe it was recorded in the 80s or something old yeah old guys you know really special music so when you okay you you went to new york and you then you listen to this music and then try to come up with your own stuff did you also try to learn the um some no. of the traditional songs or no, I didn't. I, I'm I'm not. Uh, I'm very careful with this thing. It's very strange because I I achieved to perform music that was in my brain. So it's a very strange thing, and I'm somewhat afraid. Even though maybe it's not, it wouldn't it wouldn't do any any wrong to me. But I'm a little bit afraid of spoiling this by introducing concepts or learning concepts, right? And right. So I'm I'm not really learning music from others. I'm just taking influences. Like I have no idea about flamenco or classical music, but I've heard this and I've heard that and I've heard that other thing. And to me, it's, I'm I'm following the thread 
of this question. If I was locked in a room for the rest of my life, what melody would I be able to listen to forever without killing myself? Right. It's like, what would I, what n- note would I choose next that I would be able to live with for the rest of my life? Yeah. Like, I know it's very dramatic, but it, it comes from this. No, I can relate to that. Yeah. Like wanting to, to do well, well, let's look for beauty. How do you do that? And it's, you only need your ears for this, you know, your ears. And it's a, it's a physical feeling, emotional feeling, right. but you're going to sing this note afterwards and suddenly you're going to be so emotional. Oh, this is so beautiful. Right. So it goes through this pattern and many of these melodies you find that are melodies that you listen to when you were a kid from this soundtrack of this movie that you really loved you know it relates to your past and your experience as a human being yeah right no no i can really relate to that and i also try to incorporate that thought when i compose that i don't want to change a note although when i play then my music on stage i'm going to change a lot because i'm going to react to the moment but the compositional process is very much like a very deliberate, you know, what's the next note and what's the only note that it can be, you know? Yeah, exactly. But how much, how much does change when you play live? I mean, the actual notes, does do you sometimes go other places? No, with a guitar, especially no, it's a, it's almost set in stone. Yeah. And yeah. with the voice, there will be a little more freedom also because I'm more free with the, this instrument. But no, it's basically more like a classical composition where right. it will be written, although from the first moment when the melody comes out, I don't change any note. There's no like going back and fixing any line. Uh, so the, the creative process is going to be pretty straightforward. It just comes out the way it is. And afterwards, the performance will change emotionally with dynamics with, you right. know the richness will become will be from other aspects but the core like the spinal cord of the song which are the notes themselves don't change right okay i don't write these songs down yeah and it's funny because I, I live a lot to destiny there's songs that i will remember forever that i can still play mm-hmm. and some songs that faded away right. and i'm okay with it you know it's like okay how about when they off. when they fade away on stage does it happen it happened once when I fully understood that I don't have any way of continuing a song. And now maybe yes, but before, if I miss one note in the middle of the song, I don't know how to continue because it's not an intellectual process. It's right. very much finger memory. Yes. So I realized that only my fingers have the power to play this song <laughs> <laughs> because this part of me, Mm -hmm. While it's performing, it's taking care of the melody and the lyrics. The guitar has its own process that's very much physical memory of my fingers. And when I realized this, this, that show was horrible because I kind of understood how... um, It made you realize. ...precarious it is, yeah, how out of control it is. How about now? I I see you uh, playing uh, sometimes in duo with Yoaf, the guitar player. Yes. Uh, and you guys sound wonderful together. It's it's really great to see you guys together. Uh, I'm wondering what the process there is. Do you, you show him the music, or yeah? Yeah. So I will write the song the way I write any other song, with a melody for the voice, and then the part of the guitar, and then he will just learn the melody, the, what I would sing in the voice. Mm-hmm. It turns, it becomes into the second part for the guitar, and that's it. And we perform it together after. Mm, okay. Yeah. Does he write it down for him sometimes? He doesn't, no. He's very good. He learns it by ear. Mm-hmm. All the musicians I play with learn the music by ear, which right. to me is way much better. It's yeah. much more present from the yeah, beginning. Nice. No. Yeah. yeah. How did you learn to play the, the piano? Just going, just sitting down. My mom had a piano in her house and I would just sit down and play chords and make up stories about pirates and princesses that wanted to be pirates. And, you know, yeah, it was very natural for me. Yeah. Mm. How is it for you then to listen back to your music? Uh, Maybe you've recorded yourself or or, um, you've recorded a, a concert and then you want to improve something and you want to lock into a specific moment. 
you know how how do you go about it right it's just a different it's a different process from from other types of music i guess first of all um i'm not since the process of writing is not due to my intellectual effort of every day having learned this and having practiced i consider this music to be a little less mine it's like a situation that happens to me instead of me making it happen so in this sense when i hear a recording back which will almost never happen the show happens that it i don't listen back that it's over okay um but if i listen back I, I will distance myself from it unconsciously even like it's like oh it's that thing that happened there why would I want to improve or move anything I don't know I feel like the piece when it comes in it, that's the way it is it's this organism hmm. um, I can improve the way of playing it that is only by improving the, the way I am as a person so I will just book a trip to Costa Rica and go to the middle of the jungle, experience some things there that I'm afraid of. And then when I come back, I'll be able to play this song better. It's just because I've explored parts of myself that I didn't know of before. Mm. And I think this is the most important concept for me. How do you have, how do you get the sense of beauty? Because everyone can learn technique, right? But how do you learn to have good taste, like what is good taste in the end? Like how do you make something yeah. sound beautiful? What is this feeling? How can you listen to some players that can play very sparse notes and be so emotional, right? Why some players make the audience cry and, other, and others don't? And a friend of mine told me once, what you're going to perform in, on stage is always only your relationship with your instrument. There's nothing else happening. It's like the way you experience this thing. So it's an experience of yours with this instrument that you're using to transmit something that gets to the people. If your experience with yourself, like the depth in yourself is only limited, that's as much as you can transmit to the rest of the room. I feel really strongly about this. Mm. So... Mm, I understand that there's so many music schools, so many people that go to music schools because one of the reasons is there's a lot of musicians who don't have any other job. They have to be teachers, right? They're going to have to be in a school and, and, and get a position there to be able to pay the rent. And it's great, but there's like an overexposure to this. And, um, and so you're going to try to make music into things that you can teach. And there's only a part of music that you can teach. It's like all the names and all the positions and all the musical structure. But you cannot teach feeling and you cannot teach emotion. You cannot teach uh, like self-discovery in mm -hmm. a school. It doesn't happen like that. So this part gets neglected most of the times. You know, I mean, if I you have a good teacher, he can, be, he can lead by example, I suppose. You know, and yes. show you how how he's producing a feeling or how he's approaching the music from an you know, emotional standpoint. Or uh, I'm just talking about because I had a great teacher who could tell me all about technique and stuff, but also had very great, uh, um, um, how should I say, you know, vision about music, about how to approach music to make it happen uh, or to let it happen more, you know without interfering, you know. He had a very uh, philosophical approach about making music, which is very, uh, which was very inspirational for me. So I, I think it, it depends on your teacher, but I... I it, it really does. But I, I'm with you. There's, a, there's a, um, a big weight on, you know, conceptualizing things and making them teachable. And therefore, sometimes the music loses its magic or its... its Uh, individualism yeah. because it gets like okay you have to do this and this and this and then you're you know all about the music and then you just be yourself you know right right no but no what is the it, thing is, yeah. you know what is it what does it mean to be yourself you know i, I think it means experiencing a very bright spe wide spectrum of emotions it means uh, getting out of your comfort zone and uh, yeah traveling there talking to this person doing this doing that eating this new thing right it's just being in constant movement which is the equivalent of life and mm. and it, it's really funny i was talking about 
this with you have before uh, about the fact that the the whole globalization, you know, the whole thing is that uh, we're all eventually uh, learning to live in and experience things the same way because we are going to these music schools or these, uh, you know, colleges that have this set of rules. Like I was looking into ANSI, the American National Standard Institute, you know, that... um, that gets into consensus to what is the standard of certain things of like chemical protection and healthcare. And they're the ones that they decide, okay, which pitch are we going to use to tune all our instruments right in the Western world? And it's like, wow, this is crazy. Before there were so many different groups of people that were separate, that had different cultures and different traditions and they played music in very different ways. So in a way it was much richer Mm. right now we are, kind of like fitting into this one tube all of us right so so it's interesting that uh, eventually we lose the notion of who we are mm. and uh, and what would be more natural for us maybe you should play in 432 all the time because your sense of pitch is there not in 440 and did anybody explore this you know as a musician did you ask yourself am i comfortable with these standards of music or not should right. i switch over or not you know it's just like oh that's what the book says okay i'm gonna go through this right mm-hmm. yeah it makes sense are there any other like standards that were put on you that you had to you know in a musical world let's say uh that you had to throw away for you and say okay i'm not i'm also going to do it different this way yeah so right now i'm going through a very very emotional and exciting process of writing my music down being like okay if I write the music if I create the music in a different way why would I write it in the way everybody does maybe my music requires another way of writing so I'm looking I'm working with this guy uh, Philip Golub who's a a great uh, composer and copyist into creating a chart that a lead sheet that can still be read by traditional musicians, but that includes all these things that I need to include. So it will be an unconventional way of writing music. It will include colors and it will include movement and it will include several shapes, you know. Right. Um, so it's really interesting to work on these things and, and, and see where is the edge of what the mind can understand, but involving the emotion a little more. If you use a note in a staff paper that is like a quarter note, right? And instead of writing the regular quarter note, so you write this, right? Instead of writing this, maybe you can write this. And it's yeah. this, but it's just, it's a moon. and But you can still read it because it's, in you know, it has the same colors, just have a different shape. How much of your emotional capacity it will bring into playing this note just because it has the shape of a moon. But mm. you'll still be able to read its uh, its measurement, right? Right. So it's it's a really nice, beautiful process to kind of like just expand the walls of what reality is. Mm-hmm to be able to fit what you created, what came to you, in the best way possible. Do you think about other people playing your music? Yes, a lot. Uh, since I um, I did my Tiny Desk, which is uh, this uh, show in the NPR and the National Sorry. Public Radio. It's beautiful. This video, thank you, um, which is basically the only thing I have out because uh, I've been trying to record for a long time. Um, Many people have asked me to to how how they can transcribe my music, and so that's why this is why I want to write these charts to have them available. I would really love people to play my music. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Do people come up to you? I mean, do you teach sometimes people coming up to I, you for I lessons? I taught for many years. Yeah, I was uh, teaching until June last year, almost full time. And since June, I started touring and things started going better in the live music side. So I could quit teaching, but it's something I really enjoy. And I had to come up with these concepts because I taught mostly children. And it was really heartbreaking to see the lack of of interest, first of all, from the kids, the reasons why they were put in a classroom. like my dad wants me to play piano, right? 
and how to make them fall in love with music. Mm -hmm. So that was uh, a really beautiful process for me. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I'm, I'm asking because, you know, sometimes my experience with, with teaching is uh, somebody is asking you how you do it. And in the moment where you want to give your clever answer, you're, you're like, wait, how do I do it? You know? <laughs> right. And then you have to, in a way, strengthen the foundation of what you think you're doing by thinking about it, realizing it, and then telling it to somebody else. And while you do it, yeah, it strengthens what you already think you know. Uh, and sometimes I've, I've got so many realizations by speaking about it, you know. So I'm, I'm, I was just asking because of your, you know, specific particular background and your uh, unique way of, of, you know, learning this music uh, or realizing your music. I suppose there are other ways of realizations of when somebody asks you, okay, yeah, so how do you do it? Or how can mm -hmm. you make me or show me how to do it? Yeah. Should I tell you how I do it? Well, if you want to. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it's we... very basic. It, it, it's just interesting to to see how so far it's been working well without me having the capacity that I have very basic theory knowledge, right? And there's the children on my hands where I have to teach them how to perform music and how you can do this without the theoretical and technical part of it. It's a really interesting process, but mm. uh, as a kid, the first thing is you have to make the kid fall in love with music. They need a reason to be there, right? If they're going to hate the piano lesson that they mm -hmm. have once a week, it's never going to work. Right. And this is, the pro this is basically the main problem people have, especially when they're teaching kids. It's not like they, they can all teach a scale and they can all teach them how to play the basic chords and how to read the basic uh, sheet of music, but how do they make them engaged in what they're doing that's the that's the main problem right right so that's where stories come in mm -hmm. stories and um, how do they relate to the characters that they're playing music from and that's the thing that most teachers are lacking the capacity to put themselves in the position of a kid you know mm. it's like What is the thing that children enjoy the most? Unfortunately, nowadays, it's like video games and all this stuff, but the, every kid loves a bedtime story before they go to sleep. So I transcribe this into your teaching, right? Mm. You grab a, you're going to play a song from Bach. Just do some research on Bach's background. Tell the kid about the story of how Bach did this and he wore this, this wig And, uh, you know, the kid is going to start relating to this character yeah, true. and make up a story about his life. How did he write this piece? Okay, you know, and you put the piece into a concept of a story. It's like you, you invent this imaginary world for the child to be inside of it. It's not the child and the chart and there's a separation. It's like the child is inside of the chart because he can relate to the 360 character who wrote it, you know, and then yeah. it becomes much easier. It's really nice. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, you've just mentioned uh, that we don't really have a record of you out yet, you know. And we talked about this at the Clang Festival already at, when you had dinner. Uh, we talked about, you know, because I was asking, you know, when's your first record coming out uh, in that podcast that I initially mentioned in the beginning of our conversation, Larry was like, okay, I'm going to produce your next album. So I thought, okay, where's, where's this album? And what did Larry do? <laughs> <laughs> and then you told me that you already recorded so many songs and you can't really find the proper place of when to stop and say, okay, that's it, you know? And maybe you can, yeah, tell me a little bit more about that process and, and where, you are, where you're at now. Yeah, it's so painful. It's such a painful <laughs> process because it's uh, if you're writing music in a different way, you're trying to transcribe it in a different way too. I haven't found a way to record it in a different way either. And the main problem has been that I haven't found a way to record the music that doesn't lose 
its emotional layers in the process of recording it. Like it becomes this echo of what the song is because, yeah, I mean, even if it's on tape, analog or digitally, it, what I've found is that I have this apple that I put into this machine that is the, a recording uh, studio and recording uh, machinery, and then it comes out into an eaten apple. It's not the apple anymore, you know. It's just like the core of the apple, but the, the pulp and the body of it is gone because uh, it, it doesn't have, it misses all the nuances, it misses all the details, and there hasn't been a, a mic powerful enough to, to enact as the, as the ears of a human being. You know, mm-hmm. and I know technology is getting there. It's really far, but I think mentally I just have to realize it's a different concept. It's a different way of experiencing music. Right. And that has been the painful thing for me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah. that that sentiment isn't at all unprecedented. I think there's, you know, great artists like Sally Bidacha famously said, you know, music is gone after it's uh, performed and it should be performed live. And you can't make uh, a recording of it out of it because it loses everything. The music was there, and then it's gone, you know. Yeah. But, but still, don't you see it as? I mean, you've enjoyed music from records, I suppose, by others. Yes, I have. I have. So, do you have these thoughts there as well? No, I don't. It's very judgmental of of myself, of my own music, and it's. Uh... Yeah, it doesn't have to make any rational sense either, you know. Yeah. It's just these emotions, um, including many other things. I guess you're also letting go uh, when you're recording something. You're making it a way of yourself, it's like yeah. removing a limb and being like, this is not mine anymore, right? Mm-hmm. And it's there and it's on its own and it's ready and able to be judged and put into this uh, overly stimulated uh, world of information and then forgotten and swallowed. Mm. by the monster so yeah it's a it's a very painful process i think the most painful process that has ever been in the history of music recordings the way people put music out now and how available it is in a way it's so nice and in another way it's so uncreative Mm. so uh, so devoid of inspiration the way people put music out nowadays and how it just dissolves so in a perfect world what what would you how would you put it out if recorded perfectly you know recorded perfectly would be not recorded i guess it would be that um that people would fill the rooms i play in and i would be in a constant touring for many years now i understand i want to listen to the music of my favorite artists while i'm at home so in this way, maybe the best way would be to make cinema out of it, to make a more, a broader way of uh, representation of music. So whatever the music, whatever the sound waves cannot represent would be represented by image and by colors. I mean, you've done right. that before, right? In a, in, in a small way on your YouTube channel. I mean, that's how you initially put your music out. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah. I mean, that's that's uh, that's one thing that's very interesting. But still, an album, a Spotify list, a playlist is just sound, it's and true. and it's nice as well. I guess you have to to let go of this idea. It's just one take of this one song. It's just one way of playing it, mm-hmm. and that's it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think there has to be one moment where we all say like, okay, that's I'm not going to change this. This is a photograph of me right now, and I'm going to look different. I'm going to look more tired in 30 minutes. I'm going to uh, have more gray hair in two weeks, or whatever you know. Yeah. Or I'm going to lose weight and be much more in shape. You know, uh, you don't know, but yeah, we're very obsessed of the control of the present, and that doesn't help. We have been listening to uh, um, technologically made music for a long time, so that for sure must have changed our perception of pitch and of rhythm, because the pitch and the rhythm that we listen to in the, on the radio is not human-made anymore. It's mm. made by an algorithm. It's MIDI, so 
it's really interesting. It's like maybe things now that we would consider are out of pitch are actually the way the human voice reacts because this is an organic instrument, but we're used to the machine, you know, that's mm -hmm. so pitch perfect in the center. That's, that's unnatural even, right? Mm -hmm. So I think we're getting there or like with a Instagram filter that makes your eyes bigger, or all these steps. Like we are bringing these concepts into the music we're making yeah, it's all true. the time. It's true, yeah. Yeah, and it, I think it's uh, in a way so um, godlike. It's making us so powerful into the things that we can make. And at the same time, we're not paying attention to the other edge of the sword, which is, wow, we're losing all this organic music making and art making that is being uh, demystified and and downgraded because it's just less less accurate mm. and less uh, perfect yeah i re i really uh i like the the instagram analogy because i think a lot of music nowadays is like going with the slick and and uh, catchy first idea and that's it usually you know sounds like a great coda to a song or something yet when i think about your music um i feel like especially you have a you have a great and very unique sense about form i can really follow it most of the time because i'm always uh, i'm always i'm always surprised by okay here's another section okay here's a totally different feel now you know also uh, la realidad that song it goes places you know um, yeah and by listening to the first idea i couldn't really say or predict where it is in five sections from from now you know but the last section of the song is exactly like the first one that's true yeah Where i mean there's, there's a... always a going back home which is to me the most exciting process of writing a song it's like the leaving you're taking from this point to that other point that's the unknown And then I reach a point that, the, like, inspiration is like, oh, that's it, it's done. And now the the what I consider is the most personal part of my of the song is how do you go from this place back home? Yeah. And this like half moon process mm -hmm. is the most fun and the most beautiful. Yeah. I like that too, and I, I do that a lot in my pieces as well. Like, yeah, I wanna I wanna go back somehow to that first sentiment, but I always want to have a an element where. Um, that first idea has changed throughout the whole uh, journey. Because whenever I, I leave my home in the morning and I come back at night, I'm not the same guy anymore because stuff has happened to me. I might look you the are... same, I might wear the same stuff, but my wallet is, <laughs> wallet is lighter or <laughs> you know, whatever. <laughs> stuff, stuff happened to me. So there has to be a resemblance of that in the music. So yeah, I, know, I really know what you mean. Yeah, and it's great because what you're talking about, it's what we were saying before, like if nothing happens to you, how are you going to fulfill this song, right? Mm. It's like you have to feed yourself out of experiences and things so your music can be the representation of yourself, which is what happens all the time. And that's what we do it for, I think, because we're trying to, in the end, ultimately understand what life is. And art is this. We're trying to make a, a sketch in front of our eyes of how we feel, of what we are, what color we we believe in and what ideas are the ones that drive us. You know? <laughs>